Good morning and welcome to this service on this Easter Sunday. If this is your first time with us, a really warm welcome to you. And if you're joining us on the stream online, uh, we're glad that you're able to be with us too. Uh, This morning is Easter Sunday and we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So I wanted to begin with a reminder of that, uh, and a reminder that we can all participate in together. So I'm going to say, Christ is risen, and then if you could respond, he is risen indeed. Just that we can affirm together that Jesus is raised from the dead. So Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. It's a historical event, as the Bible records it, and we know from history But it's also an event that really makes a difference in our life, the resurrection of Jesus. Let me read these words. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, 
undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Two words from those verses that uh, rely upon the resurrection and can be ours because of the resurrection. Or a living hope and an inheritance that will never fail, fade, or perish. The resurrection matters in our lives this morning. So let's pray and thank God that Christ was raised from the dead. Lord, we thank you that Jesus didn't remain in the grave. We thank you that as the disciples and as those those women went to the tomb on that Sunday morning, the grave was empty. He was gone because he is alive. And Lord, this morning we can celebrate that truth. We can remember that event, but also think and be reminded of what it means and the transformation it can make in our lives here today and into eternity. So we pray that you would bless us and encourage us. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Well, we're going to stand to sing our first song this morning. Uh, It gives us something of the story of the resurrection as Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and discovered that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And then after we've sung this, Steve is going to come and do the children's talk and just uh, talk a little bit more about the resurrection of Jesus. So let's stand and sing. Thank you for coming, it's great to see you all. And particularly if you're a visitor and you haven't been here before, really good to see you. Now James is gonna come up and help me. Um, James, if you go and stand over there, James is gonna be our emoji this morning. So he's got two faces, just wanna hold them up one at a time, James. He's got a smiley face and he's got a sad face and that's gonna help us know how 
uh, we or the people in the story feel. Right, I'm going to teach you about disappointment this morning. I'm going to disappoint you. So, for the children, who would like something of what I've got here? Who would like something of what I've got here? Okay, now, I'm just going to remind you, this is all about being disappointed, okay? (laughs) This is all about being disappointed. Now, would you like any of that? No. Do you know what it is? No. Pickle gherkin. (laughs) Oh, what did you think was in here? Oh, how do you think they're feeling, James? Oh, now, tell you what. Oh, look what's underneath. Would you like one? You can take one. You can, you can take some for your brothers as well. There you go. Now you pass them on. There you go. All right. Um, all the other children, you can have some at the end, okay? It would take a bit too long to hand them all out now. How are they feeling now, James, now they've had some chocolate? Ah, right. There are Maltesers in there. And children, you can come and have one at the end. Okay, disappointment. They thought it was going to be something great. And then it was pickled gherkins, which I like, but not everybody does. Okay, story this morning about two people. The first Easter day. And these two people were on a journey. They were going from um, a bigger town, city, to a small village, from Jerusalem to a place called Emmaus. That's a bit like if you were walking from Peterborough to Whittlesea. So quite a long walk. And as they were walking, they were talking to each other. And they had a lot to talk about because they were followers of Jesus. And two days ago... Jesus had been killed. How do you think they were feeling about that, James? They were. They were feeling really sad. The Bible tells us they felt really down. They felt really down. And as they were walking, a man came and joined them. It was Jesus, but they didn't know that. And he came alongside, and as they were walking, he said, what is it you're talking about? Uh, And they said, are you the only one that doesn't know the things that have been happening? And they told him about Jesus. They said, this man Jesus, he was from God. And he did, and he said, amazing, wonderful, powerful things. And we had hopes that he was going to rescue our people. But then he was killed. And so how are they feeling about that, James? They were feeling sad, disappointed. Everything they hoped for seemed to have come to an end. But, they said, some of our friends this morning met met an angel and they were told that he's alive. And we're confused. We are confused. And so they're walking. They're still walking. They're still on this journey. And Jesus said to them, they still don't know this is Jesus. Jesus said to them, you are really foolish and slow to understand everything God has said. And as they were walking, Jesus began to explain to them from the Bible why he had to die. He said this, on the other side, he said this, the promised saviour had to suffer these things, and then enter his glory. Jesus had to go through the bad thing, the dying, the disappointed thing that the disciples were disappointed about. He had to do that to save us. Why? He had to do that to deal with with my wrong, with, with, with the wrong and the sin of anybody who trusts him. He had to do that so he could enter his glory, so that the good thing could come. Now, he's walking along with them. He's explaining these things. What is the good thing? What is the brilliant news? It's him there with them, Jesus. He's walking with them. They are sad because he's died, and yet here he is alive with them, right there and then. Later on, 
They stop, they eat together, and he lets them see who he is. They see that this is Jesus. He's alive. And when they're talking about it afterwards, do you know what they say? They say, when he was telling us about all these truths, it was like we were on fire inside. It was like our hearts were burning, but in a good way. On fire because they knew Jesus. So, they had been James. How had they felt about Jesus dying? Okay, just like expecting the chocolate but getting gherkin, that's how they felt. But now, here is Jesus with them, and he's alive. How do they feel about that? Big, smiley faces. He's alive. The sadness is gone because he's alive. Now, I don't know how you feel about the message of Jesus. Maybe you feel that him dying on a cross is quite a bad story. And it is really sad. It does teach us just how bad our wrong and our sin is. But Jesus did come to die, but he came to rise again. And the wonderful news of Easter is that he is alive today. Not just then, not just walking with those two, but he's alive today and anyone can know him and anyone who comes to him can also know that fire inside, that heart that's on fire because Jesus is alive and gives life to any who come to him. That is is good news. That is smiley face news. That is way, way better than any disappointment you might feel. Well, praise God for that. We're going to sing a song together now. Thank you, James. You can sit down. Thank you very much. We're going to sing a song together now. If you don't know it, I think you might be able to sing it with us because it's to the tune of Jingle Bells. Okay, so if you know Jingle Bells, you can sing this song. So this is to the tune of um, Jingle Bells, the chorus. Then we've got a verse in the middle um, and then the chorus again. And the song tells us Jesus saves. That is what he does. He came to save any of us, each of you, if you will say sorry for your wrong and trust him. So let's sing this great news together. sit down and we'll just pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we want to thank you and praise you because Jesus is alive. And we celebrate that today. We are very sad that he had to die. We're sad about our own sin. Please help us each to say sorry to you, to mean that, because of our wrong. Oh, but we thank you for a saviour who came to save. Please help us each to trust him. Thank you that we can still have eternal life through him. Thank you that he's alive today. What a, what a wonderful God you are. What a wonderful saviour Jesus is. And we praise you for him today. Amen. Thank you, Steve. How many of us are confused? 
Christmas, Easter, what's going on? A um, few announcements. One is to let you know that we do have a creche for pre-aged children. If you want to make use of that, that will be from any time from after I pray in just a few moments. It's in the hall behind me. And to get to the hall, if you go out the door um, in the foyer that you came in through, go round the side of the building and then just, just go straight ahead through the doors and then the blue doors that you see. So please, if you want to make use of that, do, um, do do so. Uh, next week, we have a fellowship meal after our morning service, which everyone is invited to. Uh, you don't have to bring food along to, to, to come, but if you'd like to contribute to the food, there are some sign-up sheets in the foyer. And it would be really helpful just to know numbers. So if you do want to come, please do sign your name up and let us know that you're coming. And then for those in uh, SOS, our Sunday school and Bible class, which meets before the morning service each week at 9.30 in the hall behind me, that starts back again after the Easter break next Sunday. So just for you to remember about that. As we come and pray, we've been, um, a couple of weeks ago, we, we started uh, sort of specifically thinking about how we can pray for Open Doors, uh, a ministry that works with Christians around the world who are persecuted for their faith. And a couple of weeks ago, we prayed for Christians in Afghanistan. And this morning, we want to pray for those in North Korea. Often, these times of year, like Christmas or Easter, it can be a particular time where the persecution intensifies on Christians, uh, and so it can be a more difficult time of year uh, as well as the time of celebration. So let's pray for our brothers and sisters in the, the country of North Korea. Let's pray together. Father, we do want to pray for your people in North Korea. We thank you that in that very difficult country where it's very hard to be a Christian, where the government sees Christianity as a threat to national security, we thank you that there are believers. We thank you that you have graciously called several hundred thousand people to follow you. We thank you for their faith. We thank you, Lord, that they've been saved through Jesus Christ. We thank you that they are your children. And Lord, we want to just pray for them this morning. We pray, Father, for a change in the heart of the government of North Korea. A change from seeing Christians as a threat, the presence of a Bible as something to kill someone for, to seeing the difference and the good that those who follow you can make in society. We pray for a change of heart in the leader of North Korea, and in the government. We pray for your people as they have to be Christians in such secrecy because of the dangers that they face. Even reading of parents not being able to let their children know that they follow Jesus. The difficulty of meeting together like we are doing here for encouragement and a reminder of who you are and what you've done. Father, we pray for them. We pray that you would give them wisdom as they seek to know when to speak and when not to, when to be open and when to be quiet. Lord, as there are those who would want to trick them into professing that they're Christians, and might come in, in the guise of a brother and sister in Christ. We pray that you would give them discernment. We pray that you would give them perseverance as it is hard and difficult each day to follow you. We pray that you would give them strength and joy and the encouragement of your Holy Spirit. We pray that they would know, particularly today, that Christ is risen and that he is the King of glory. That he is their king, our king, our shepherd, the one who watches over us. Lord, equip them, Father, with your Holy Spirit for all that they need. And we pray that whether they find themselves in a prison camp, 
where they are under forced labor. Or, or they find themselves in prison or waiting the death sentence. Or, or they find themselves free in, in name but s- still so concerned about what may happen. We pray that you would enable them and help them to shine brightly with the gospel of Jesus and the hope that he brings. Lord, encourage them, we pray. Thank you for the encouragement that our brothers and sisters in North Korea are to us as they keep going with Jesus. Lord, we pray for your blessing. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, we're going to stand and sing again a a song that reminds us of the resurrection. Lo, in the grave he lay. And then the chorus, up from the grave he arose. Let's stand and sing. Nikki's going to come now to read to us from God's Word. Thank you, Nikki. I'll read it is from John chapter 11, verses 1 to 4 and 17 to 27. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha, It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, the illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. 
Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. Thank you, Nikki. I want you to think for a moment about some word associations. So if I say a word, just think what comes into your head associated with the word. So the first one is the word Linica. What comes into your head? Linica. Probably football or crisps, depending on you know, where you've heard of Gary Lineker from. But the second word, Cadbury's, comes into your mind when you think of the word Cadbury's. Chocolates, sweet, maybe the Easter egg that you got given this morning was a Cadbury's Easter egg. What about this word, life? What are the things that come into your mind when you hear the word life? Uh, I thought about that for for a few minutes this week. Um, I had a picture of a heart monitor. You know, that kind of monitor that shows that someone's alive when they're in hospital. I remember visiting my granddad um, when he'd had a heart attack in hospital, and I was too young to realize that the sticky pads didn't always stay attached and they got removed. And there we were talking to my granddad and the heart monitor was going up and down and up and down and up and down and then it stopped. We were still talking to my granddad, but it had stopped. And I said to my mum, what's, what's going on? He's dead, but we're still talking to him. So a life, a heart monitor, life, fresh air. Get out in the fresh air, speaks of life. Spring flowers, the life that comes around this time of year as the the gardens burst into life. Maybe you think of a birth of an animal or a child. Maybe you think in the terms of fun and extreme experience. That's life, living life to the full. Well, when we come to Easter, the Bible tells us that Easter, the Easter Sunday, is A time all about life. We see it in the event of the resurrection of Jesus. He was dead, but now he's alive. This is a time about life. But it's not just something we look back on 2,000 years ago. The resurrection of Jesus means that we can have life today. I want us to think... Uh, in the next few minutes about some words that Jesus said to Martha in the reading that Nikki gave us from John chapter 11. Uh, The context is that there's Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. They live in a a place called Bethany. And Lazarus has died. And the three of them are friends of Jesus. They turn up from time to time in the Gospels. And so Jesus goes to visit them. Lazarus is dead, he's been laid in the tomb, he's been buried. And Martha comes out to see Jesus, and she's distraught, she's sad. And she kind of comes to Jesus and says, why why didn't you come earlier? If only you were here, Lazarus could have been healed. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So what I want to ask, what is this life that Jesus is speaking about here in this verse? What is this life that he is talking about? Well, first of all, it's life that's bigger than material happiness. It's life that's bigger than material happiness. Where where do we so often look for life? Where do we turn if we want our lives to be improved? If you were to come to me and say, you can have anything you want, anything, just, just name it and you can have it, what would I do? Well, I might go on right move and uh, go for a bigger house or a better house, somewhere with some more land, 
Maybe if I prefer a city, I'll move to a city. Maybe if I prefer the country, I'll move to the country. That would make my life better, I would think. Or maybe I'd say, well, can you take me to um, the car sales room? What do I fancy? Mercedes, BMW, Jack? I don't know. Aston Martin, maybe. If I had one of those, and, and I could get in it each day and feel that power and get on the open roads, although maybe they'll use a bit too much fuel at current prices, I don't know, but um, if I could have them, then maybe my life would be better, or I'd go on the internet, I'd look at the gadgets, or, or book a holiday, something to look forward to. Maybe I'll think about the people in my life. Maybe there'd be some people I don't want in my life, and some people I would want in my life. I don't know. But I would think very much in the material sense, change my circumstances. Uh, maybe I'd say, look inside, well, I just want to be a bit more true to myself. I would look very much at what's here, what I can touch, what I can see, what I can feel. But Jesus is talking about a life that is much, much bigger than those things. He says this, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Just think about death for a moment. What does death do? Death separates us from the things of this world. That's what it does, isn't it? That's why we resist it so much. That's why we don't like it so much. That's why we grieve it so much, because death separates. If my life is in my house, death separates me from my house. If my life is in my car, death separates me from my car. If my life is in my holidays, well, I can't have another holiday once I die. If my life is in the people around me, death separates me from them. That's why we hate it so much. But Jesus says here, the life he is giving is something that death will not separate us from. Though he die, yet shall he live. So what is it? Later in the book of John, just a few days later, Jesus is praying to his father, and as he prays, he prays this. This is eternal life. This is the life that he's talking about here in John 11. This is the life that Jesus came to give. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The life Jesus came to give. The life Jesus is talking about here is a life where we can know the living God, a life where we can know the infinite God, the creator God. What's that like? Let me give you three very brief descriptions. It is a life of constant wonder. Why? Because we know the infinite God, the God who is all-powerful and immense. I wonder if you've ever seen an awesome scene in your life. Have you ever gone somewhere where you've been stunned by the beauty or the power or the immensity of what's in front of your eyes? For me, one of those occasions was going with Anita. My, Anita, my wife, is Canadian, so I went to visit her in, in Canada, and we've been over a few times. Uh, we're going to Niagara Falls, and standing at the side of that waterfall although kind of calling it a waterfall doesn't quite um, capture the, the sort of magnificence and the size of it. Just standing by the side and just watching tons and tons and tons of water just pouring over. Kind of, your jaw just drops. It's an awesome sight. If you know God every single day, the immense, infinite God who just stuns and amazes is with us. It's a life of wonder. It's a life of security. I was always struck when um, my kids were smaller and we came across a, a scene of potential danger. Uh, maybe a dog that they didn't know that was barking. Maybe walking through a field of cows, and cows look quite big, to a child. That they would come and hide behind my legs. And I think, as if I'm going to save them. If I can stop, you know, a cow starts charging at me. If, that, if just having me in the way is going to make any difference. But they came and hid behind my legs because 
I kept them safe, or they thought I would keep them safe. Because I was bigger, I was stronger. If you know God, the infinite, all-powerful God, that, that no one can defeat, that no one can overcome, He is the one who keeps you safe. It's a life of security. And then it's a life of satisfaction. We all have this feeling within us that this life does not satisfy us. No matter how much we try and throw ourselves into this existence, no matter how much we try and gather around us stuff and people and situations and and sort of mold everything into exactly how we want it to be, we are never satisfied. We know it will not deliver, but yet we keep going again and try and get more and more. Over and over, people testify that when they come to know God, they realize that search is over. The life Jesus is talking about is more than material happiness. And and I think it's important as we come to the Bible and we think of life in Jesus, that we kind of park our dreams. Those dreams, I'll have the life I want when I have this, when I've got this, when I've got this. We've got to park those dreams Not because we need to be prepared for disappointment. Because Jesus will come up short. But because Jesus is talking about something so much better than what we've dreamed about. Something that blows our dreams out of the water. So this life is bigger than material happiness. Secondly, it's bigger than just this lifetime. It's bigger than just this lifetime. If you want to live life, if you want to live life to the full, what does that mean to us today? Well, one way that we can look at it is it means we've got to cram everything in as quickly as possible. We've got to have everything now. We can't wait another few years because then it's been wasted. So often we get things on credit or loan to get hold of things. We've got to cram in the experiences, so every weekend we've got to be out doing stuff. And there's kind of a reason for that, isn't it? We know that there's a clear beginning to our lives and a clear end to our lives. And the time in between is really not that long. And the older you get, the quicker those years seem to go by, and the, re- the, the sooner you realize that that end's going to come about someday. So if we want to live life, we kind of take the Amazon Prime approach. It's got to be here tomorrow. And we pack everything in. But Jesus here is talking about a life that's different to that. A life that, yes, has a beginning when we are born, and particularly a beginning when we come and put our faith and trust in him, but doesn't have an end. Look what he says there. Everyone who lives... And believes in me shall never die. Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. If you've ever been to the theatre to watch a play or a musical, or, or sometimes I think it even happens at the cinema, doesn't it? At the point that the end comes and the curtain comes across or comes down. And the, the end has happened and you've got to go. Well, Jesus is saying here that the curtain never comes down on the life that he gives. It never ends. What does that mean in reality, though? Because Christians still die. People who trust in Jesus still breathe their last and are buried. We have funerals here in this church of people who've been Christians maybe a short time or or a long time. So what does this mean? Well, it means that even death doesn't end life for the Christian. In 1 Thessalonians 4.13, Paul is speaking to a church who is struggling with this very issue of death and what does it mean. He says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, what he means there, those who have died, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. There he uses the word asleep, though, instead of death, because... For the Christian who dies, this life that they have in Jesus is still very real. 
Okay, the life here has ended, but the life with Jesus is continuing. In Philippians 1 verse 21, Paul writes of his own testimony, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, that's a strange statement, isn't it? Particularly when we think of how much we base our life on the stuff that is here and the people that are here. To us, often, if we, look, if we think like that, to, to die is loss. But Paul says, no, for him, to die is gain. Why? Later he goes on. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. He says as a Christian, when his time here on earth comes, he goes to be with Jesus. The life that Jesus gives remains. And before we have a wrong impression that it's then just a kind of us floating around as a spirit in some kind of ethereal place, the Bible, at the end of the Bible we're told that no, that's not the eternal end point. The eternal end point is a new heavens and a new earth, a new creation where we will have new bodies and live with Christ forever. Here's the description. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. That's the hope, the living hope we read of right at the beginning of the service. It's there because of the resurrection of Jesus. That is this life, the eternal end point of this life that Jesus gives with him forever in paradise. He's talking about a life here that goes beyond our lifetime. And it's really important, I think, as we, we look at these words of Jesus where he says, I'm the resurrection of the life, that we expand our minds beyond what we can see, beyond what we can touch, and beyond what we can feel. Not because there's nothing for us today. Knowing God makes a difference every moment of our life. But Jesus is talking about more than today. He's talking about eternity as well. So what is this life? It's more than material happiness. Secondly, it's bigger than just this lifetime. And the third thing I want you to notice about this life, it's only found in Jesus. It's only found in Jesus. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. He doesn't say, I'm a signpost to the resurrection and the life. Look, if you want it, I can tell you how to get it and you need to go over here. He doesn't say, I'm a signpost. He doesn't say, I'm one of the ways to the resurrection and the life. Uh, If you want resurrection and life, well, you can come through me or, or you can go any other way if you really want to. No, he says, I am. I'm the only way to the resurrection and the life. And when we think about what he did on the cross, that makes absolute sense. Because he's the only one who dealt with the barrier between us and God, the barrier of our sin, the barrier of our disobedience, the barrier of of us living life in our way without reference to him. On the cross, as Jesus died, we read, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. A, a, a kind of a, a symbolic barrier between where the people could come in the temple and where God was said to dwell. If you imagine it like this, a city with walls. And in the walls there are are big gates. And if they're shut, you come up to the gates. What do those gates say? You can't come in. There's no way in. But when they're open, there's a way in. You can come in. There's a welcome. There's an invitation. Well, the Bible says our sin puts a wall between us and God. But at the cross, the gates were opened so that we could come in. Only Jesus dealt with sin. Only Jesus opened the way. 
And only Jesus rose to give us life. See, Jesus is alive today. That sets him apart from any of the other religious people that people follow. He is alive today. He's not dead in a grave. He's alive. And that life, as we read in 1 Peter 1, 3 to 4 earlier, means we can have hope and we can have life that will never perish. I want you to think about the England cricket team. This is not an unusual occurrence and it shouldn't require too much imagination. England are playing in the ashes and there's been a batting collapse. One through to nine have lost their wickets. They're all out for a duck or a very low score. And then on comes the last batsman. And he scores a triple century and they win the game. Who won the victory? Well, he did it, didn't he? Yeah, I I neglected to say he managed to work it so that he was on strike every over and and no one else hit a ball after he came on. But he won it, didn't he? He won it. But the team share in the victory. On the cross, Jesus won the victory over sin and death. But we share in it if we come and put our trust and faith in him. It's absolutely vital if we're to understand the life that's talked about in the Bible that we understand how important Jesus is to that life. See, the Bible offers new life. The Bible promises new life. The Bible invites us to come and know God. But there's only one way to receive it. Come to Jesus. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So this morning I want to ask you a question. Do you want this life? This life that is bigger than material happiness. This, is, this life that's beyond our lifetime. If you do, there's only one question that you need to hear this morning. And it's the one that Jesus asks Martha. I am the resurrection and the life, he says. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? I encourage you this morning, come to Jesus. Come and discover this life that only he can give. Repent of sin. That's a life lived your way. Looking, looking for um, satisfaction in other things, looking for fulfillment in other places. A life live your way, not his. Trust that he died for your sin. Trust that he is the one who can give you life and bring you to God. And commit yourself to him and know this life for yourself. If that's something that you're feeling you want to do this morning, please come and talk to me or someone here in the church afterwards. We'd love to sit and pray with you and talk some more to you about the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, help us to know this life that only Jesus brings, to to see just how amazing it is that we can know God, that you want us to know you. Lord, maybe there's... Those of us here this morning, that's just finding that unbelievable and difficult to believe. I pray that by your Spirit, you would pour out your love into our hearts, that we would know that you want us to know you. And that you sent Christ to die so that we could. And help us, give us faith to believe. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we're going to stand to sing our final song. It's a song, really, a response uh, to the invitation of Jesus to come and know him by faith above the voices of the world around me. Uh, let's just think about these words as we sing them through together. Um, and, and consider as we sing them, are these words that we could really pray to the Lord uh, this morning? So let's stand and sing.
So before we close, we do have teas and coffees that will be served from the front here. So please do stay and join us uh, for that. Let's pray. Father, there can be all kinds of reasons that we would not turn to you this morning. Lord, we've sung of some of them, sin and self and shame. Lord, we pray that you would break through any sense that we have of thinking that you wouldn't want us in your kingdom, but that we would listen to your words and your invitation and put our trust in you. Lord, may you pour out your grace upon us, we pray. Amen.